Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Bill Sirks, and I'm the chair of the City of Edina's Energy and Environment Commission. Our topic tonight is what's up with the weather, which uh, we couldn't have asked for a better day to talk about this. So um, anyway, and I got to congratulate our speaker, Paul Douglas. A lot of times weather men or weather people say, I only forecast the weather, I don't really control it, but we all know better. So thank you for having just the wonderful example of what we're talking about and how our climate is impact. We are impacting the climate and that does impact weather, particularly on days like this. So thank all of you for braving the elements and coming out tonight and hearing uh, about the topic and what we can do working together to try to make a difference on this. So uh, starting now, first thing we'd like to do is play a short video welcome from Senator Al Franken and then I'll introduce the mayor and get to the rest of the program. Hi, I'm Al Franken. I'm sorry I couldn't join you today for your annual environmental discussion, but I want to congratulate you on your leadership bringing everyone together each year to address the important issues of climate change and the environment is a model I hope others will replicate. I want to highlight the great work of the organizers of this event, including Mayor Hovland, Edina's Energy and Environment C Commission, the Community Foundation, Excel, Centerpoint Energy, and the Center for Energy and Environment. By joining forces, you've made Edina a Minnesota leader in reducing your carbon footprint by investing in energy efficiency and renewable energy. I'm so proud that Edina has set up Minnesota's first commercial PACE property assessed clean energy program and has completed two projects under it. Edina has taken an all-encompassing approach to sustainability and as a result it is one of just four cities in Minnesota to receive the Step 3 designation from Green Step City, a very impressive accomplishment. While you're achieving great things in Edina, I'm working in the Senate to address climate change and to promote clean energy. As chair of the Energy Subcommittee on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I'm developing legislation to further support the energy efficiency and clean energy work that you do here. I've also been happy to collaborate with many folks from Edina through my Back to Work Minnesota initiative. I'm so happy we've been able to work together to retrofit buildings, saving building owners money and creating jobs by promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy. There are so many opportunities to move forward with energy efficiency and renewable energy projects in Edina. As you continue, think of me as a partner and a resource. Please let me know how I can help. Keep up the good work, and thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our mayor, Jim Hovland, who's going to introduce the other speakers and also go over some of the actions that Edina has taken recently in this area. So, Mayor Hovland. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I noticed that one of the folks down here thought the microphone sounded a little bit echoey. And I, does it seem that way? It seems that way from up here. Stand back further. <laughs> Just hold it. Yeah, is this? No, no, that's, that's worse. No, it's better? Okay. All right. Well, the first thing we have a little bit of housekeeping before I talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in, in our community. Um, did everybody uh, get a chance to sign up for a free home energy audit? They're going to give away three of these audits this evening. And uh, if you raise your hand, if you didn't fill out one of these cards, uh, someone will come around and hand you a card so that you can be eligible for a uh, drawing or eligible in a drawing for a free energy audit, one of three energy audits we're going to give away. All right, good. And then also, um, I got one of these this evening from Paul Thompson, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. But uh, if you want one of these signs for your window, for your home, you can, uh, I guess, make arrangements out in the foyer to be able to get one of these placards and put in your window at home. Now, uh, Senator Franken mentioned a few of the things that we've been involved in. And I want to say that... Um, 
Edina is not only the first city in the state to uh, put together the space funding program, property assessed clean energy funding program, we're actually, it turns out, uh, according to Bill Sirks, we're the first city in the Midwest to do it. And we've offered the uh, template that we put together with a grant from the, um, from the state uh, to other communities that want to do the same thing. Uh, I don't know if we've had a lot of activity. I see our city manager and assistant city manager here. He's nodding his head affirmatively that a lot of communities have been contacting us to see how to get involved in this kind of a program. And we've got uh, more opportunities looming out there. So that's exciting. Uh, Senator Franken also mentioned that we were one of the uh, uh, first cities uh, uh, in the state to get the, to uh, level three on the Green Step City program. As, as you all may know, I see a lot of people here that uh, we see that are ardent environmental folks. Uh, you know that we were a Green uh, Step City pilot program community, and we went through that process, helped the state analyze uh, whether the uh, conditions they put in place to become a Green Step City actually made any sense. And I think uh, led by a lot of folks on our Energy and Environment Commission, uh, we found out that uh, most of them worked and some didn't work quite as well as we thought they should for uh, establishing state standards. I'm looking around and seeing a lot of folks from our Energy and Environment Commission. I want all these folks to stand up. I see Diane back here and Paul and Bill. Would you stand up so people can see? Because these are the folks, at least some of the folks, on the Energy and Environment Commission. Big help. Big, big hand. Uh, when I signed uh, with the Council's authorization, the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement uh, back in 08, we then formed an Energy and Environment Commission, and we have talent galore in our community on this Energy and Environment Commission, and you saw many of them just stand up, and they have been just doing stellar work for us. Uh, some of the other things we've been involved in, uh, we've got um, uh, the bike lanes uh, and the movement towards living streets, uh, more uh, walkability, bikeability on the non-motorized, uh, uh, in a non-motorized way. It's going to also help us be a, become a more healthy community over time. Uh, you know, we laid in about 10 miles of bikeway. We were the second city in the state to uh, uh, to do something that this that was this. I don't know if radical is a good word, but it was uh, uh, innovative. Let's use that word instead. Uh, now, the folks that, that didn't like Wooddale Avenue probably thought it was radical uh, because we laid in 10 miles of bikeway and we had a problem on an experimental basis with about eight tenths of a mile and we're going to fix that this spring. So I think I expect to see a lot of folks out using those bikeways. So uh, we've, got, we've got some very good things going on. We helped with the formation of the Edina Interfaith Environmental Co uh, Coalition. Uh, there's the Edina Go Green group, uh, Sarah Zarin's group, and Cool Planet. Paul's group and Mindy's group that are working with business recycling, the farmer's market, churches, and Edina Public Schools. Uh, and uh, we've been doing just terrific work, but we've got, some, we've got some significant things that we need to work on. When I look at the data, when all of us, I think, look at the data that we've gathered on our baseline, we got work to do on carbon reduction, and we've got work to do on reducing our water usage. So we need to start working on that uh, in a real ardent way. I think if you uh, are a fan of Bill McKibben and you follow the work that he does, 350.org, uh, 350 parts per million is what we can tolerate on CO2. We're going to be pushing for the 400 level here fairly soon. So we need to be very, very mindful of what uh, we're doing in terms of uh, carbon emissions and we can do a better job in Edina and lead the way there as well. So. Uh, those are some of the things that are going on in, in your community. Many of you are working on these things. Uh, we also recently, uh, incidentally, switched to a single sort. Uh, the folks that were involved in this whole recycling, Diane uh, helped lead that. Uh, would you stand up? Because we've got some great work going on there. We've increased our tonnage uh, for recycling uh, significantly due to this new program. And, and I think it's just wonderful what, what the, they have done in terms of carefully thinking this through. Uh, and then uh, going to the implementation phase, phase, and we've really been benefited by it. We converted from dual sort to single sort recycling. We're the first city in the state to require haulers to report on the amount of solid waste being removed from the city. This enables us to determine whether new recycling initiatives are having a positive effect on trash, trash reduction. We're adding recycling bins in city parks. 25 were added in 2012, and 25 are being added in each of the next three years. And we're beginning organics collection at City Hall in Edinburgh with other city facilities to follow. You all know we just established a community garden and an edible garden. I think the 55 spots that we had available for a community garden, uh, they were gone in six days, and we've got a bunch of people on the waiting list. So 
uh, we've got a, a lot of folks in our town that just uh, want to be shown the way and, and uh, we're off to the races in many different areas. So I'm going to introduce uh, Paul Douglas now. You know, when I, when, I, when I see Paul sitting here and I talk to him out in the hallway, uh, it, it makes me think about watching WCCO, and that's, what, that's, that's the station I generally watch uh, in the morning, early in the morning and at night. And I keep thinking all these weather people are just sort of temporaries. I say, well, well, well when's Paul coming back from vacation, you know? And uh, you got these uh, interlopers on there that aren't, uh, you know, they're not interlopers, but they're, uh, they're like uh, stand-ins for the guy who should be there, or, or at least I want there uh, all the time because uh, he provides all of this wonderful information. He's got this uh, incredible background, and he's so well qualified and so articulate at the things he, uh, he tells us. And, and uh, he's also a fantastic businessman, and he's made a business uh, uh, of his um, uh, training uh, and his uh, experience as a weather person. He was Minnesota's first certified broadcast meteorologist. Uh, he writes a daily print and online column for the Star Tribune. Uh, he's on the CSRRT, the Climate Science Rapid Response Team, and a member of the board of the NRPE, the National Religious Partnership for the Environment, TV meteorologist, author, teacher. He speaks to corporations about severe weather trends, and his entrepreneurial ride launched nine startup companies. Um, Previous companies included Earthwatch Communication, which invented 3D weather graphics for television stations worldwide. He was featured in Steven Spielberg's movies Jurassic Park and Twister. And his last venture was Digital Cyclone, which was the first company in the world to put an application on a smartphone in 2001. He sold that company to Garmin in 2007 to focus on his latest ventures, and he'll probably tell us a little bit about it. So I, without further ado, I want to welcome Paul Douglas. and. We're going to have an intimate little conversation tonight with a lot of people that really know what's going on. And uh, uh, if the weather hadn't held us up, uh, I think we would have had a lot bigger crowd here. But you can come up and tell this core group of folks from Edina what's up with the weather. Paul, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. I'm amazed anybody's here tonight. <laughs> Hornets are hardy. I did not realize that, but I'm impressed. And I tell people, you know, global warming is probably something of a misnomer. Yes, the atmosphere is warming. It's uneven. Um, global weirding is probably a better descriptor of, of what we're seeing worldwide. And one of the things that, that really got me interested in this topic. So let me see if I can call up the right presentation here. Okay. By the way, uh, Dave Dahl called me to uh, apologize about the weather outside. Uh, he feels terrible. And we're going to wind up with about six or seven inches of snow, so there we go. No big deal. It's Minnesota. And we're two months from the summer solstice. So, okay, it's great to be here tonight, and, uh, and thank you for braving the elements, and thank you for the very nice welcome from Mayor Hovland. I, I'm genuinely impressed. Edina, more than just about any community I know, is really leaning into this challenge. I tell people it's a threat, and it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for towns, municipalities, and the United States to reinvent itself. I can prove with one slide that the warming is real. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? We have to try to keep our sense of humor, <clears throat> which is hard to do some days. And, you know, I get this all the time. Every time it snows, I'll get 10 emails. Hey, Paul, where's your climate change now? Where's your warming now, Paul? It's snowed at my house. Like, first of all, if it ever gets to the point where it doesn't snow anymore in Minnesota, we have a much, much bigger problem. So be glad it, it's still capable of snowing outside. And the other thing I say is, can you see the globe from your window? You know, I think we're hardwired as human beings to what, what's in front of us? 
What's today's threat? What do I have to worry about now? It's harder keeping that global perspective, and that's one of the challenges that we're faced with. But again, whether is will you need long johns or shorts tomorrow, I think I know the answer to that. Climate is the ratio of long johns to shorts in your closet. <clears throat> weather is CNN headline news. Climate is the history channel. So I tell people you have to keep that into perspective. Meteorologists obviously track the weather, day-to-day -day fluctuations in the atmosphere. Climate scientists keep that global perspective over decades, centuries, millennia. And keeping that global perspective is tricky. And this is why a lot of television meteorologists, one of many reasons why they don't cover it during their weather reports. I tried at CCO. And to their credit, they gave me just enough rope uh, to be able to try to cover this on the air. But it's a challenge, you know, in a three or four minute weather cast to be true to the climate science. The other thing with television, we all know it's a popularity contest. Everybody on television wants to be loved. Because if you're not loved, you're not renewed, your contract is not picked up. And you know that the minute you start talking about climate change, you will invariably alienate 10, 20, 30 percent of the viewers. So the news directors are very uncomfortable when their meteorologists start dabbling in climate change, because they can almost hear the TV remote controls switching to another channel. So many days I felt like I was swimming upstream. But this had nothing to do with Al Gore. My conversion, for lack of a better word, I'm a skeptic. And I tell people, it's good to be skeptical. You should be skeptical. But persistent cynicism in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence, not a great way to conduct policy. And it's a slippery slope into an abyss of ignorance. So when it comes to the climate puzzle, it is something of a paradox. A lot of people say, well, we need more data. Let's wait. We're not really sure. This could be natural. Our kids will figure this out, maybe our grandkids. Our grandkids are going to be pretty pissed. Um, and, th and I tell people what I honestly believe. Your kids, your grandkids are going to ask, what did you know when and what did you do about it? Were you part of the solution? Did you sit on your hands? Did you kick the can down the road? There's a good friend of mine. Are you open to new data? A lot of pe who wouldn't say, of course, I'm open to new data. But it turns out that many people are not open to new data. And if you don't trust the scientists, are you willing to dig into the science yourself and not rely on Uncle Joe's blog posts or Rush Limbaugh, who, by the way, is an entertainer? If you get your climate science, if you get any science from talk radio, it's a problem. For me, it was no overnight epiphany. And again, it had nothing to do with a movie. I noticed in the 90s, just tracking the weather, living the weather, that something had changed. And then I got to wondering, why doubt the climate scientists? What motive do they have to mislead? Is this really a global conspiracy? Why? And in general, I am skeptical of conspiracy theories, the tinfoil hat crowd. I just have a lot of questions about conspiracy theories. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I love to start new companies. And here's the thing. If I don't respond to data and trends, I'm roadkill. My business will go out of business. So I have to be very careful and react to the data. And I noticed in the 90s, after being skeptical in the 80s, I thought James Hansen was premature in 88 testifying before Congress. But then in the 90s, living the weather, it seemed as if Mother Nature had picked up a DVR, put our seasons on fast forward, 
and turn the volume of extreme weather up to a 10. Suddenly, average weather had shifted. And I started talking about this in the Star Tribune and also CCO, and I was amazed by the pushback that I got from some people. For some people, they just didn't even want to contemplate that this could be happening. So again, this whole concept of normal weather, the weather has never been normal in Minnesota. We just go from one extreme to the next. But the velocity of those changes and the frequency of weather extremes began to shift, at least as far as I was concerned, in the mid and late 90s. And exhibit A of global weirding outside your window to be getting this kind of snow in late April is unusual, but it may be tied into changes in the Arctic. And we're seeing more of what I call black swan weather events here in Minnesota and worldwide. Things that just make you shake your head and ask, what the heck was that? Like 2010, when we had 145 tornadoes in Minnesota, most in the country, there were professional storm chasers in Oklahoma who were coming to Minnesota to chase tornadoes. By the way, 2011, probably the most severe since 1816, Yale did a study. Four out of five Americans were personally impacted by severe weather or natural disasters, and one in three, one in three were injured by severe weather in 2011. We're seeing some changes, some apparent shifts. Of course, we all grew up with Tornado Alley. We don't live in Tornado Alley, but we do live in Tornado Cul-de-Sac. We're very, very close. And yet, in recent years, some of the most violent, some of the most deadly tornadoes have been touched down east of the Mississippi. Dixie Alley, especially Alabama, Mississippi, on up into Hoosier Alley, and that's a problem because the public, not quite as weather-wise as you go east, Oklahoma people know what to do, not so much in Kentucky and Alabama, but we see this apparent eastward shift. Then, of course, last year, just off the scale, freakishly warm. So here's last year three to five degrees above average. Here's average, whatever average is, going back about 130 years. Data from NCDC, the National Climatic Data Center. And here's 2012. I got this um, photo from Lee Fralick. March 27th of last year, magnolia trees in full bloom on the campus of the U in St. Paul. And he said, Paul, this is what we consider to be a business-as-usual scenario. This would be typical of what the climate models are predicting for the year 2090 in Minnesota. We got a glimpse. We got an early glimpse. And people say, well, it's cold outside, so that means global warming is a farce, right? Well, the folks at NASA among others, keep an eye on global anomalies. And we've had 334 months in a row of worldwide temperatures above the 20th century average. Here are the anomalies for 2012, all of 2012. Yes, very warm over North America, much of Asia and Europe as well. But 10 of the 11 warmest years on record worldwide have taken place since 2000. And these changes in the Arctic are, are very worrisome. Here is uh, the extent of the polar ice cap, September 14th, 1984. Here we are last September. So notice the change, 30 years. And some people say, well, so what? Well, it turns out that we've seen about a 75% loss in ice volume in the Arctic in just the last 30 to 40 years. And it's happening faster, much faster, than the computer models projected. Computer models don't do a good job with melting ice in general. And so when people say, wow, those alarmist climate scientists, I go, you know what? If anything, they've been ultra conservative about what's happening in the Arctic. Here's the IPCC projection. This was the prediction 
of how Arctic ice would diminish out to the year 2100. And here was last year. This is happening well ahead of schedule. And what's happening in the Arctic may be trickling down to our latitude, something called polar amplification. If you warm up the North Pole, you decrease the temperature gradient from north to south, which decreases the wind speed. Suddenly the winds, the jet stream winds become lazy, and you don't have that progression from west to east. Weather gets stuck in a rut, and that's what we've been seeing the past couple of years. And if you're under a big bubble of high pressure, it means drought and extended heat. If you're under a storm, it increases the potential for flooding. So this is what we're seeing, this propensity for atmospheric holding patterns that amplify either the heat or the moisture. And again, last year we had a very positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation, which kept our winds howling from the west, from Vancouver, a very mild flow for just about the entire United States. Then we had record melting of Arctic ice, and we had a bubble of high pressure, warm high pressure over the North Pole, which displaced the cold air that should have been over the North Pole farther south, over Hudson Bay. So I know it sounds strange, but connecting the dots, and this is from Scientific American, by the way, you can make a case, a fairly sound case, that changes in the Arctic are, in fact, impacting our weather. If anything, sea level is rising faster than the IPCC projections. Ask anybody in New York City or coastal New Jersey, and they will tell you, yes, sea level has gone up about 8 to 10 inches in the last 30 to 40 years. And 90 to 93 percent of the world's warming is going into the oceans. Yeah, I've never seen a storm like Sandy, which was this weird mashup of nor'easter and hurricane, three times larger than Katrina. We have corporate uh, clients in New York City, and eight days before Sandy struck, we said, you know what, pay attention. The European weather model is pulling this superstorm right into the northeast. And I had a hunch that this was going to possibly even impact the 2012 elections. So, and that now has grown into a full-time briefing service for Fortune 500 companies that are scared to death about weather risk and climate risk. They know that something has changed. We can't change the weather, probably never will, but we can take steps to be better prepared. Poor Barry Bonds, who will be best remembered for the analogy of weather on steroids. You can't prove that any one of his 762 home runs was the result of steroids, but physicians will tell you that it probably influenced his base state. It increased the odds that he would smack one out of the park. And for many years, climate scientists said, well, you can't really prove that that storm was turbocharged by a warming atmosphere. Now they're saying a warmer atmosphere is flavoring all weather. You can't separate it out. We are loading the dice. It's as if you went down to uh, Williams Arena and raised the floor, the court, by six inches. You know, you'd get more th threes, more slam dunks. How's that happening? How are you sinking more, more shots? Well. We raised the court by six inches, and that's what we're doing with the atmosphere. We are increasing the potential for these head-shaking, jaw-dropping black swan weather events. Natural disasters have increased three to four X, weather disasters, since 1980. And I see this increasingly, weather whiplash. There was a seven-month flood on the Missouri River in 2011. Following year, last year, the worst drought since the mid-50s. Chicago was in a really rough drought. Now, I don't know if any of you saw on the news tonight. They just had six, seven inches of rain, sinkholes, a state of emergency in Chicago. Now they have more water than they know what to do with. The drought is definitely over in Chicago. We just see more of these whiplash moments. 
Downpours have increased. The rain is not falling as gently as it did for your parents or your grandparents. Mark Seeley tells me there have been four separate thousand-year rainfall events in Minnesota since 2004. Of all the stats that I spout, this one still makes the little hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Every thousand years, you should have one of these. We've had four since 2004, including the Duluth flood last year. And again, I'm, I'm driven by data, not ideology. The trends are, are pretty clear cut. The rain is falling harder. And I'm not a statistician, I don't play one on TV, but we seem to be getting one of these one in 500 year floods every couple of years. You start scratching your head. Last year's derecho started in Iowa, tracked all the way to D.C., straight line winds of 100 miles an hour. I've never seen a storm that big affecting that many people. But, you know, it was 105 degrees with a dew point of 75. We're getting supersized storms. Not too many climate skeptics in insurance companies. Um, you can see a steady increase in billion-dollar weather disasters, 86 of those between 96 and 2011. So the, the rate of billion-dollar disasters seems to be on the increase. And don't let anybody in Florida give you a hard time about weather disasters here in Minnesota. The odds of disaster much greater over the south because of tornadoes, floods, and hurricanes. Suddenly the cold fronts don't look quite so bad. And when I get a call from my friends down in Naples, you know, in January, asking me how the weather is, I say, well, it, it's good. Uh, you know, it's 12 degrees, a little snow in the air. We have a storm coming in tomorrow. But at least our storms don't have names. <laughs> Click. Try that next time somebody gives you a hard time. Hey, it's, it's going to snow. We're still going to see cold fronts. But again, step back and look at the big picture. Make a note, not of the temperature in your backyard, but make a note of the new species of birds, plants, flowers, trees that are growing there that did not grow there 40 years ago. Much of the metro now in climate zone 5. That's a relatively new occurrence. We're seeing this 100 to 150 mile northward shift in vegetation. The question is, none of us take Minnesota's quality of life for granted. I worked in Chicago three years. I never once heard the expression quality of life. And that's not a knock on Chicago, but we have something very special and very unique, unique here. And I grew up on the East Coast, and I've been all around. There's nothing, nothing like Minnesota. And I'm just concerned that what we've been able to enjoy, will we be able to pass this on to our kids and our grandkids? Our winters, current one notwithstanding, are shorter on average. Think about it. I mean, yeah, this, this, this is a little worse than average. Typical. Winter, we get 55 inches of snow. This winter, we'll wind up with 60, 63. Okay, we've had a lot worse than that. When people complain, I say, look, average 22 nights below zero. That's the 30-year average, 22 nights below zero. Anybody want to guess how many we've had this year, this winter? Nine. Very good. Weather-wise crowd. I'm impressed. But... The snowfall, ask any snowmobiler. It used to snow in October, and it would stay on the ground through at least March. According to Mark Seeley, we've seen a 4x, 4x increase in midwinter rain and ice. We are seeing fewer sub-zero nights. Jack Falker, right here, a Dyna resident extraordinaire, sent me this graph, which... I printed in the Star Tribune and I referred to, he plotted the coldest temperatures in the Twin Cities every winter dating back to 63. Jack Rose Roses, if, if, 
right? And so this is information that's essential in terms of knowing what can grow when. Back in the 70s, consistently it got down to 30, 35 below, coldest temperature. Now, okay, gets down to 15, maybe 15 below. But again, I'm no rocket scientist, but the trend is pretty impressive to the point where we are now in climate zone five. Things can grow here that couldn't grow here 30 years ago. Here's data from the State Climate Office showing the temperature trends. Southern Minnesota above, here's northern Minnesota, and you can see the rate of warming. In the northern part of the state, it's warming about 7 degrees Fahrenheit per century. Here in the southern part of the state, 5.5 degrees. Average ice out date. Again, nature rarely moves in a straight line, and neither does science. It can be a tortured path at times, but you have to step back and look at the trends. 95% of all lakes worldwide are warming, including Minnesota's lakes. And I tell people, you better get out to Glacier National Park soon. Back in 1850, there were 150 glaciers. As of 2006, that was down to 36. Another marker, and there are a lot of markers. This science does not depend on one thin thread of evidence, whether it's the acidity of our oceans, what's happening to coral reefs, what's happening to glaciers, sea level rise, on and on and on we're seeing evidence of a shifting climate. So the forecast for Minnesota, increasingly warm and dry, when it does rain, it's going to come down harder. Tropical rains. So, why so much pushback? I love this quote from Schopenhauer, all truth goes through three stages. First it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, finally it's accepted as self-evident. We are now pretty deep into phase two. I think 30 years from now, I hope 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, man, I'm glad that's over. I hope we get there. People say, well, there's no real consensus. There's still a lot of debate. Yeah. If you ask electrical engineers and geologists, there may be some debate among climate scientists, and there are a few thousand PhD climate scientists worldwide. There is precious little debate. Of 14,000 peer-reviewed climate articles, 24 rejected the notion of man-made global warming since 1991. We're releasing about 7 million metric tons of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. And here's one of the problems, one of the challenges. It's clear. It's odorless. It's colorless. If, if greenhouse gas has left a black film on everything and everyone, think we might have cleaned this up 30, 40, 50 years ago? But the fact that we can release this, we can pollute with impunity. Nobody sees it. Nobody smells it. Where did it go? We'll let our kids figure it out. 750 billion tons already floating overhead. Here's the famous Keeling curve for David Keeling, who was the first to track the rise in carbon dioxide on the summit of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Not a bad place to do business. We are close to 400 parts per million. And again, the long-term average, and it's fluctuated over the years, 280 parts per million. This is uh, data from the Vostok base, the science base in Antarctica. And what you see in red is the temperature. And this goes back 400,000 years. This is from ice core samples in Antarctica. And there's a very tight correlation between the release of greenhouse gases and between the subsequent temperature. This is nothing new. This theory is nothing new. It dates back to the early 1800s. What I can't get past is that carbon that took many millions of years to develop into coal, gas, oil, has been released in really what is a geological blink of an eye. 
There have been other releases of greenhouse gases in the past, mainly from volcanoes, hundreds of millions of years ago. That took thousands of years to build up to the level where it could melt ice and, and drag us out of an ice age. This is in the span of 50, 100, 150 years. There has never been this rate of greenhouse gas release. So climate is a complicated issue. La Nina cooling phases of the Pacific and even volcanoes can mask some of the apparent warming. Here's the famous hockey stick. Michael Mann is a friend of mine. He's been demonized. He's a professor at Penn State. Um, he's had his, his life threatened, his kid's life threatened, because he dared to produce this graph showing an upward spike in temperature going back a couple of thousand years. The first thing they did was look at the urban heat island. Of course cities are warmer. No, we don't rely on thermometers in cities or near cities. Here's a new paper from Marcotte, and this goes back 11,000 years. Warmer now than 75% of the last 11,000 years. What made it warmer many, many years ago? Changes in the Earth's orbit, these Milankovitch cycles, changes in the Earth's tilt and orbit around the sun. Clearly, the past 150 years, not within normal variability of the last 11,000. If anything, we should be cooling right now. And in te instead, temperatures are spiking. This is data from Antarctic ice cores. No time in the last 680,000 years has carbon dioxide been above 300 parts per million? Now we're up close to 400. And the question is, is it going to 500? Is it going to 600? When will people sit up and take notice and actually start to do something? When will our politicians get serious about this? There's a lot of proxy data. We have data from ice core samples, tree rings, microfossils, very robust set of data, especially Antarctica, going back, again, hundreds of thousands of years. People say, well, it was warmer in the medieval warm period, Paul. No, it wasn't. It was warm, relatively so, but this warming can be traced to increases in solar activity and fewer volcanoes, which have a cooling effect. Unless you have thousands of volcanoes going simultaneously, Volcanoes have a slight cooling effect. Here's what's unique. The warming is both hemispheres, and it can't be explained by natural astronomical triggers. Changes in the Earth's orbit, tilt. What's left? Man-made greenhouse gases. So here's, you can cherry pick anything. If you pick your starting year, you know, let's start 1998. And maybe we can make a case that temperatures have leveled off. Really? Really? Okay. Yeah, this is how skeptics view global warming. The realist, I don't know. Looks like a trend to me. This is my favorite, one of my favorite photos. I don't believe in global warming as the water rises. We're addicted to fossil fuels. And there's a lot of money in play. And right now, there is a fairly significant, to put it mildly, campaign to discount the impact of climate change. Because there is so much money at stake, trillions of dollars of carbon still in the ground, ExxonMobil wants to be able to harvest that carbon for their shareholders, their profits. They don't want any regulation. The radicals are not the ones who are campaigning against the Keystone XL pipeline. The radicals are the CEOs who know that their product they are selling is changing the chemical composition of our atmosphere. Those are the radicals. <laughs> yeah. 
This reminds me a lot of the 70s. Remember when Philip Morris trotted out the pseudo-scientists who said, well, it's tragic what happened to Aunt Betty. And yes, she smokes three packs a day of camels. But you can't prove that smoking three packs a day of camels killed poor Aunt Betty. And there was a time in the 70s when some of us sat back and thought, you know, they may have a point. Scientifically, can you connect the dots? Now, we look back at that period of mass psychosis and insanity and say, of course, smoking increases the potential for lung cancer. You're really going to argue that? So this is the whole smoking debate times a thousand because there is so much money at stake. And the media loves a good food fight. It's good for ratings. If people sit there and agree, who wants to watch that? Let's get a protagonist and an antagonist, and let's have a food fight. And so let's get a couple of skeptics who may not be climate scientists, but they're really interested in this topic. And we'll have them debate climate scientists, and it'll make for wonderful television. It allows a handful of skeptics to be treated as equals with thousands of PhD climate scientists. Skeptics usually don't publish. In fact, they almost never publish in peer-reviewed journals. They publish on their blog, on their website, and then people forward that, and people mistake it as science. Often these websites, these papers, are funded by energy companies or lobbies. And I tell people, if you get an email or a web link, follow the money. Science is not about opinions, it's about a process. And sometimes it seems to me that people want it to be democratic. If enough people raise their hand, maybe we can change the science. It doesn't work that way, it never has. Other theories have been tested. The first thing they looked at was the sun. Turns out the solar constant has decreased since 1985. If anything, we should be cooling. We are, in theory, on our way to another ice age. Looking at the long-term track record of Earth, other people say, well, it's the volcanoes. Turns out the state of Florida emits more CO2 every year than all of the world's volcanoes. There's not much debate in the military or in insurance circles about what's happening with our climate. General Anthony Zinni, we're going to pay for this one way or another. We will pay to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll take an economic hit of some kind, or we'll pay the price later in military terms, and that will involve human lives. How long are we going to keep sending our kids to protect the oil supply lines. I have a son in the Navy who just graduated from the Naval Academy, and it makes me nuts thinking that he might have to defend the oil supply chain so that we can fill up and go about our lives. There has to be a smarter way to do business. I sat down and talked to uh, John McCain, one of my heroes. By the way, I am a Christian, I'm an Eagle Scout, I'm a Republican, and I think climate change is a real concern, which makes me the equivalent of an albino unicorn. <laughs> but 2007, we were welcoming Iraqi war vets back, and it was at the Hilton in Minneapolis, and I sat at his table, and I said, Senator, is it possible that this could just be a fluke, an aberration? And he rolled his eyes at me, and he said, Paul, I just got back from the Yukon, a village elder presented me with a tomahawk that melted out of the permafrost. He said, the odds of this being random, a coincidence, are slim to nil. How do we get from there to here? Who said this? I'm proud of having been one of the first to recognize that states and the federal government have a duty to protect our natural resources from the damaging effects of pollution that can accompany industrial development. Anybody want to make a guess? Ronald Reagan is right. The Gipper. I wonder what, I wonder what Ronald Reagan would think of what's happening now, the impasse in Washington. I think he'd shake his head. I don't know what he'd think. 
but the Republican Party actually, it was Nixon who started the EPA. It was Teddy Roosevelt who launched the Park Service. It was Republicans who came up with a version of cap and trade for acid rain. Here's the thing. I'm an entrepreneur. It's a threat and it's an opportunity. There will be millions of new jobs created to come up with alternatives to sucking carbon out of the ground to keep the lights on. And the question is, will those jobs be here in the United States? Will they be in China? Will they be in Finland? Will we be innovating? Solving this problem is going to require a level of innovation and reinvention. This is our energy moonshot. It's ours to lose. This is something America does better than any country on Earth, innovating. And if we miss this moment, our kids and our grandkids are going to pay a price. People say federal debt, yes, this is a problem. $16 trillion as of yesterday. And then I asked them, what about environmental debt? What we're, what we're leaving to our kids and to our grandkids? And it really does come down to a question of morality. There are nearly a thousand references to caring for God's creation in the Bible. Almost a thousand in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Luke doesn't mince words. Man has been appointed as a steward for the management of God's property, and he will give account for his stewardship. We are stewards. We are accountable. And I close with uh, one of my favorite proverbs. It's a Native American saying. It says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I want to thank you for everything you're doing, the role you're playing. I want to thank Adina for being a leader in this space, hopefully inspiring more towns around the state to do the right thing and realize that you can do something good for the environment and save money at the same time. You can actually save a little green by going green. This is going to require a social movement. You ask kids, under the, anybody under the age of 30, they do not discount climate change. Their parents might, their grandparents might, most people under the age of 30 take this very seriously. And that's what I tell politicians in, in D.C. Your constituents increasingly are going to be taking this very seriously, and so should you. We still have representative democracy, and all of you can continue to do your part by making sure that the people we elect are true to science. If 98% of doctors gave you a diagnosis, Chances are you'd listen to the 98% and not the two guys in the back of the room holding up duct tape and magnets. And yet when it comes to climate science, part of it is we don't want to believe. It's easier to deny. It's easier to turn the page. We, if it ever gets to the point where we ignore legitimate science, God help us. We're not there yet, but the actions of this generation are, uh, are going to be critical in getting this problem under control. And I'm still a naive optimist. We're going to figure this out. Thank you very much. Well, Paul has to uh, leave fairly early tonight. And uh, he knows he can get out of Edina with no problem. But he's worried about what happens when he hits the Minnetonka border. <laughs> so we're going to let him leave fairly soon. So we're going to do Q&A with Paul right now. And, and incidentally, before we start, I forgot to tell you something about uh, after the Senator Franken tape. Uh, and Bill Sirks knows about this and a few others know, Scott Neal. I got an email about uh, three weeks ago from Senator Franken's office. And uh, there's a uh, movement afoot in the Senate to establish a, a group of climate heroes around the country. And Senator Franken nominated us, the city of Edina, as a climate hero. Now, we don't know uh, anything about uh, what's happening out there other than that nomination internally. 
And so I got way ahead of myself. I said, well, what do we have to do? You know, we have to go somewhere to get this award. And hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're way ahead of her. So we don't know if we'll get it or not, but we've been uh, nominated uh, in the Senate for uh, being a climate hero, the Minnesota nomination. So that's a great, great thing. Yeah. <clears throat> now, we have, um, we've got uh, some folks with microphones, I think, that are ready to uh, address the audience folks. I'm going to hand this back to Paul so he can answer questions. Preferably yes, no questions, please. <laughs> Easy questions. Sir. Hi, my name is, is on? Uh, my name is Paul. Um, I just have a question. If somehow magically today we stopped producing CO2, would it just come down gradually? Would it stay where it is for hundreds of years? Uh, what's the recovery, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Uh, CO2 stays in the atmosphere for about a century, and that, that's, that's one of the problems. You know, unlike sulfates, regular pollution, you go to China right now and, and you can't breathe the air, you can't drink the water, you can't, in some cases, eat the food safely. But the point I'm making, that is sulfate pollution, the stuff that you see that makes the sky yellow, that settles out after a few days or a few, a few weeks. Rain brings that down. CO2, methane, chlorofluorocarbons remain in the atmosphere for a very long time. So if we could somehow magically bring all greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, somehow, by government decree, uh, we'd probably still warm another half degree. And that, nobody really knows what the tipping point is. There's a lot of concern that if it gets warm enough, that permafrost in the Arctic begins to release methane. That you have methane deep in the oceans, and that if you warm the oceans enough, could that methane automatically release into the atmosphere and accelerate so there's a lot of concern about what is the tipping point. We are basically running an experiment on the atmosphere and hoping that it all works out, which is probably not a great way to, to move forward. Um, so, and I'm sure Jay may have some, uh, Jay Drake Hamilton may have some, some comments on that as well. But we, we, have, to, we have to bend the curve. We, we have to find cost-efficient ways. And it's, it's funny, I mean, people, I think in Europe, Germany is trying to get 80% of their power from renewables, and they have a plan. Um, when people realize that they can save money and clean up the atmosphere simultaneously and that we're not totally dependent on carbon-based fuels. Natural gas, an improvement, no question. Half the uh, greenhouse gas pollution of coal. It, it's a step in the right direction. It's a bridge to cleaner fuels. But I, I refuse to believe that there isn't the energy equivalent of a Google or an Apple out there that is going to find a way to innovate and and make us less dependent. I can't believe that we're always going to have to rely on 19th century extraction technology, sucking carbon out of the ground. And like an addict, we go to greater and greater lengths to get our fix. Hey, we can drill in the Arctic. Hey, we can go deeper into the Gulf of Mexico or deeper into the Atlantic. You know, we go to greater extremes to get that carbon fix. And it's madness. And future generations are going to wonder, were they smart enough to figure out that you have to find new ways to grow? You know, everybody wants to grow the economy, GDP, jobs. I get that. But we may be shooting ourselves in the foot by feasting on carbon to the exclusion of, of other renewables. And, you know, I'm proud of what Minnesota's doing. You know, the 25% renewable by 2025. I mean. And there's no reason why we can't really become energy alley. You know, got Silicon, Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley, and why can't we be testing and inviting some of these 
startup companies to test new ways, whether it's algae, whether it's biofuels. I mean, kids in a garage coming up with new ways to create energy that don't rely on carbon. I refuse to believe that that isn't possible. Yes, good question. Time for one more, I guess. <laughs> this is going to be another one that's just as easy to answer as the last one. Okay. It's about methane and uh, natural gas. And one thing, you, you mentioned methane and carbon dioxide, but you didn't mention that methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. 20, 20, 20 times, to 25 17, times, 17, 21 times, yep. So I'm wondering what strategies might there be that you know of to combat, to at least curb the enthusiasm, the new enthusiasm for cheap and abundant natural gas coming from fracking because not only is it, it's, it's too cheap to be, it, it's too cheap to really uh, be a, a, a good alternative and it could be pricing out some of the alternatives too. Yeah, there, there's no question I think that, and I can sp speak from firsthand experience that cheap natural gas, abundant natural gas is hurting the whole renewable uh, sector right now. It's slowing things down. And I don't think we, we have the full story on, on fracking. I don't think we really know. I mean, I know we're injecting water and chemicals, and some of those chemicals are carcinogens, right, into the ground to flush out the natural gas. Do we really know what the long-term consequences are? I have a friend who has a company out east who monitors greenhouse gases. He, they have sensors all around the country. And he said, Paul, you wouldn't believe the amount of methane that these fracking outfits release into the atmosphere. And some of them burn it off. Did you see there's a, there's a satellite photo of North Dakota at night? It looks like Chicago. All the flames from, from burning off the methane trace gases above these, above these fracking wells. It was described to me that these companies can make fracking safer, sealing off the wells, taking additional steps, and it might cost them an additional 7 or 8 percent, 7 or 8 percent of margin to make these wells hold up for the long term. So it might bite into their profits. I want to believe that that there are steps that these companies can take to make fracking safer. I, I, I think fracking is going to be with us until and unless we find out that it's doing something horrible to the groundwater. Um, I'm not looking forward to turning on my, my faucet and having flames come out. I think that would, that would probably put a crimp in my day. But, you know, should we take advantage of our own natural resources? Yes. Should we have a business plan for weaning ourselves off carbon-based fuels and ramping up other sustainable fuels? Yes. Because the rest of the world is taking it seriously. If we want to be com competitive, if we want to compete in the 21st century, we have to be serious about renewables and not bet the farm literally on fracking and other carbon-based fuels. So I got to go back and track this storm uh, for the Star Tribune. One comment, it, it's going to be in the 50s, the end of next week. The computer models are hinting at 60 a week from Saturday. And uh, this is all very good news unless you live in Fargo, uh, where the risk of a record crest rose to 40% today from 15%. So one of the things we've been concerned about is a light switch spring, you know, going from slush to 60 in a couple of days. And I, I hope that isn't the case, but I have a bad feeling about the Red River. I don't think it's going to be as bad in the Twin Cities and most of Minnesota. The real concern is, is Red River. But um, keep those folks in your prayers. Thank you. God bless. Pray for spring. Let's give Paul one more big thank you, the Adina way. Hey, how about that?
Thanks again, Paul. I'm going to bring Jay Drake up. Why don't you walk up here while I'm talking about you. I think um, we met several years ago for the first time. The second time we met was when we had Will Steger, I think, at uh, St. Patrick's Church. Yeah. And uh, Jay Drake is the, uh, Hamilton is the science policy director over at Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a uh, two-decade-old uh, nonprofit uh, in Minnesota base that focuses on clean energy policies. Jay Drake used to be a professor, assistant professor at George Washington University. She got her undergraduate degree at Dartmouth, and she also attended the University of Minnesota. And she has studied climatology and water resources during her career. And um, she has spent a great deal of time doing work on uh, global warming, focusing on scientific analysis, policy development, and advocacy for clean energy solutions uh, at the scale of climate change. Uh, that will positively affect our state and our community. So help me give her a warm welcome. And we're going to hear a little bit about how she and her husband are growing organic peaches. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really happy to be here in Adana. And I just want to say while the mayor is up here, um, my friend Polar Explorer Will Steger and I have done about 200 presentations together around the country. The best one we ever did was across the street at the Catholic Church here with the Edina Community Foundation in the city of Edina. The most successful event, 1,000 people. Everyone who was anyone in Edina was there that night. That's what I heard from the state legislators. The students from Edina High School were there and were superb. And um, we really got a lot of momentum out of that event. That was in 2006. So Edina really do is a climate leader. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, thank you. My job tonight is to give you the good news. The good news of what Minnesota is doing and what Minnesota can do, and the implications for cities like Edina are very obvious, and I will give you recommendations along the way. First of all, uh, I want to tell you just a few words about our company, Fresh Energy, which is based in St. Paul, but works throughout Minnesota and the Midwest. We were formed by Minnesota citizens who were absolutely aghast that Minnesota is a big energy user state, buys about $20 billion worth of energy, mostly from other states and countries every year, and we're a small state, um, because we have no oil wells, natural gas wells, coal mines, uranium mines, but we use a lot of those products. And 20 years ago when we were formed, Minnesota had no plan to ever do anything differently, to ever move toward energy independence. And the founders of Fresh Energy knew two things. Knew that Minnesota, even 20 years ago, had this wealth of wonderful conservation and environmental organizations. Per capita, we must have more than any other state. We have great organizations in Minnesota, but we did not have an energy policy advocacy organization devoted to changing the rules of the game at the state and the federal level so that we could move forward on clean, efficient energy to combat global warming and to build our economy around clean energy jobs. And the second thing the founders of Fresh Energy knew um, was that Minnesotans, um, Minnesotans are well educated. Minnesotans are smart. Minnesotans spend a lot of time outdoors. And Minnesotans know that decisions we make on energy today are going to have 50 year consequences and in the case of climate change, a thousand year consequences. And so they were concerned and they formed Fresh Energy to let Minnesota citizens know when those big decisions are being made so Minnesotans can weigh in. The founders were very concerned that too often five people on the Public Utilities Commission or 201 people of the legislature were making thousand year decisions with not enough public input. So we'll show you ways that you can have more input going forward. First, a few words about the science. People asked me, I was on WCCO radio this afternoon, they called up, they wanted to do a story about well, glo what global warming. And they didn't know I was about to head, get into a car from St. Paul and come to Edina to talk about what's up with the weather, so I told them about that. And then they also said, well, how do you know? And I said, one of my favorite movies earlier this winter was Lincoln. And what Abraham Lincoln specifically was doing in 1863. The other thing that Abraham Lincoln, one of the many other things he was doing in 1863, is he was grappling with a Congress that even in 1863 
was dealing with technolo new technologies, new medical science, all kinds of new scientific information, and the people who were elected to Congress did not have the scientific and engineering and health background to properly understand and digest all of that before making decisions about all of that. Sound familiar? And so what he did was to set up a set of scientific advisory boards called the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineers, not to make policy, but to guide Congress in making policy. So the National Academy of Science is, is a gold standard among scientists. You can't just apply to be in it. You have to be selected. We have a few members who are here in Minnesota. We're very proud of them. Every couple of years they get asked by Congress, kind of in a cantankerous mood by Congress, is climate change real? And one of the last times they were asked that was in May 2011, and here's what they said. So it's important whenever you're surfing the internet looking for information, you could find anything you wanted on the internet. You can find whatever question you're looking to resolve. You can find whatever answer you want. But on climate change, it's important to get your answer from climate scientists, and this is a great place to start. And I always like to reiterate for people, it's very important whenever you're talking about climate change to mention these bullet points, and I'll let you read them for yourselves. Because for some of the people you're talking to, this is the first time they've ever heard this. And we can't let that continue. So we have a good background. This was just published in Science. This is the projection of the end of the era of stable climate and the nearly vertical rise in temperature. And this is in degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperatures that we all understand, projections for temperature. So this is what we need to forestall. One of the callers I got on WCCO AM radio this afternoon was someone who said something about it being arrogant to assume that humans could change anything about the climate that the climate has changed in the past. And he pointed out to me, remember, I've studied for a PhD in climatology at the University of Minnesota. So I do know that there used to be glaciers. And I know why there used to be glaciers. And I know we should be heading into a new glaciation now. Um, but that climate has changed in the past, which is certainly true. But I said, on top of that, we are pushing the climate harder, that it is changing 100 times faster than in the past. And that is the rate of change that we need to deal with. So how is Minnesota doing? Because what is important as we think about climate change and global warming is to think about what is our place in this and how do we operate at our highest level of ability. And the first lever that we can push as Minnesotans is in Minnesota. But we can't ever stop with Minnesota because we need to take it to the national level. And I'll give you some examples of that. In 2007, a few months after that forum in Edina, just a few months after that forum in Edina, which was one of about 50 that year, uh, the Minnesota legislature passed in a strong bipartisan fashion. About 91% of the legislature voted for the Next Generation Energy Act. I see some members of the next generation in the audience. Thank you for being here. It's why we passed this legislation that did three important things. For all the natural gas and electric utilities, it set a goal for them, an energy savings goal that will amount to doubling or tripling energy efficiency in this state. It is the best thing that can happen for any of us because it is the cheapest, fastest, cleanest source of new power. The second thing they did and the sexy thing that got all the attention was the 25% by 2025 renewable electricity standard, at the time the highest in the country, that applies across the board in a market-friendly way to every electric utility. In fact, for Excel Energy, it's a higher standard, 30% by 2020. And then the surprise thing that happened in the Minnesota legislature in 2007 passed science-based carbon pollution reduction goals for the state of Minnesota. So it got us on the clean energy path. And part of the reason we need to be on that path is here is where our coal comes from. We get most of our electricity from burning coal. It comes from the Powder River Basin of Wyoming. It's dug out of the ground from increasingly deep pits like this, and it's put on monopoly railroads, BNSF, 
which is charging ever higher rates for freight, because if you've been following what's happening in North Dakota, there's a lot of competition now for rail space, from oil to get the oil out of North Dakota, because they don't have a pipeline yet, and to get coal from um, the West to places like the Midwest, and the prices have gone up about 40% in the last 10 years. And the reason coal is a problem, of course, is coal is very dirty. That seems obvious to anyone who's ever looked at a lump of coal. But when you look at and you talk to people at the American Lung Association, for example, you get a sense that coal burning power plants kill people. In fact, the American Lung Association testified to that two years ago in the Minnesota legislature. The legislature was expecting the American Lung Association to say smoking kills people. But in addition, they said burning coal kills people. And here are some of those numbers. And as well as causing death, emits large amounts of mercury, ozone pollution, CO2, and soot, which truly is the black stuff that Paul Douglas was talking about. But a lot of this is invisible and very damaging to our health. Now here's a side-by-side -side set of pie charts that I got from the state of Minnesota that looks at the year 2000 and 2010. And look at this change. Look at how we've gone from being almost two-thirds reliant on coal for electricity to now just over half reliant on coal for electricity in 10 years. And the reason this has happened is because of our renewable electricity standard. So when people say, well, that's a modest policy, it's made a huge difference. <laughs> it's working. It is helping us diversify our electricity portfolio to cleaner sources of energy going forward. And we need to keep going. Think of it this way. Think of that roughly 50% in coal. If you were looking at your retirement portfolio and half of your retirement portfolio was in one stock of one company, I hope your financial advisor would say that that's maybe not a good idea and that we need to diversify, especially as we know that when we begin to account for the full costs of coal and put it in the price of coal, that is going to become a much more expensive proposition. So we need to move off coal. Most of the renewable electricity standard in our state so far has been met with wind power. And it turns out that the wind, most of the windy land is in rural Minnesota. And it is providing land lease payments to farmers and property owners out there, property tax payments in municipalities and counties that are paying for roads and schools and libraries. This is real money that we're talking about. And is helping support farm families who needed another crop. Many people have farmers who have wind on their land in Minnesota say it's their third crop, corn, beans, and wind. So that's a good way for them to diversify. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, the number of jobs. 3,000 jobs. And these are all kinds of jobs. These are everything from the person who finances the wind project to Mortensen Construction in the West Metro here that has now poured 40% of the foundations for wind farms in the country. In the country? Is that a good thing for the Minnesota economy? You bet it is. Um, to a company up in Grand Rapids called Wind Logics that helps design and plan wind farms all over the country and is looking at how to space those wind turbines and how to predict how much wind is going to be available five minutes from now. And they employ 24 PhDs in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Is that a good thing for the Minnesota economy? You bet it is. We need a lot more of this going forward. Here is what the renewable electricity standard has done for Minnesota. Um, last year, the American Wind Energy Association came out with rankings of the states. And sometimes they rank the states based on how much wind do they have. And I think this is kind of an unfair comparison because Texas is bigger in everything. So Texas always comes out on top. But Texas also has a lot bigger population than Minnesota. So when you look at per capita, how much wind in percentage form, Minnesota turns out to be fourth in the nation. Fourth in the nation. And actually, we created this graphic at Fresh Energy because I'm a competitive person. And when I heard we were rated number four, I wanted to know who is one, two, and three. And guess where they are? They're our neighbors. They are part of what is known as the Saudi Arabia of wind. And the Saudi Arabia of wind realizes it has got a product that is marketable. Now, some 
areas of the Saudi Arabia realize that that more than others. North Dakota is really doesn't quite get it how much they could do. They are much windier than Minnesota, and they could be providing a lot more of our wind power here. Um, but look at that. These are very substantial amounts of wind in our system, and they are helping grow our economy. I mentioned these science-based carbon pollution re reduction goals. This is what they look like. This is a very strict set of standards to meet. It will not be easy to get to 30% reductions by 2025, and it will be impossible to get there without a plan of action. So what we are looking for the Dayton administration to provide is a real plan of action and get moving forward on that. And they need to do that in the next year or so so that we can meet those standards going forward. If we're going to be serious about those standards, we better have a good handle on where those, uh, where those emissions are coming from. So I'm showing you these two pie charts. The one on the left is for Minnesota. The one on the right is for the US as a whole. And I show, show you them side by side to make a couple of points. One is there are a lot of different sources of carbon pollution. And so anyone who tries to sell you some snake oil and say the solution to global warming is nuclear energy or that it's wind um, or that it's something we have to invent in the future is going to be wrong. We're going to need dozens of solutions because we have dozens of sources going forward. The other reason I show you the side by side comparison is to show you how Minnesota is different than the country as a whole. Look at that agricultural wedge for Minnesota. We're a farm state. So we have different emissions, a different emissions profile. But in general, the top two sources of emission are the same. And if anyone asks you the top source of carbon pollution, it is not your SUV. It is burning coal to produce electricity, especially burning coal to produce electricity in power plants that are 40 or 50 or 60 years old and not very efficient at doing it. And the number two source is transportation. So we need to address all of these sources to get to 80% reduction, but we might as well start with the top sources and work our way down. So we have a handle on the problem. We also have a lever, a set of solutions to the problem. And one of those is people say, especially after, I think, um, last, last evening's vote in the Senate on a different topic. But it seems to a lot of us that Congress is stuck and is not able to make much action or not take any action on really any topic. Really? Show me where they've taken some action. And especially for climate that may have to wait a couple of years. Here's the good news. We don't have to wait a couple of years for Congress to pass a comprehensive law to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It turns out that they passed the law in 1970 it is called the Clean Air Act, and we are four days away now, I know this because Earth Day is my birthday, from Earth Day, from, from Earth Day. And very shortly after Earth Day, a series of environmental laws got passed into law and signed by President Nixon, and the very first one was the Clean Air Act. And here's what the Clean Air Act looks like. So when you read the law, it is all about protecting human health and welfare. It is not about polar bears. It is about protecting human health and welfare. It will also protect polar bears if properly used, but the main goal is protecting human health and welfare. The framers of this legislation were smart. They knew in 1970 that they didn't necessarily know in 1970 all of the things that we could possibly put into the, in, into the air that might be damaging to human health, and that they better have a way to periodically check in with toxicologists and scientists to see the state of the art, to see if there were any emerging problems that we needed to deal with. And so there are scientific advisory boards to the Environmental Protection Agency, which advises um, on the Clean Air Act. And in fact, by virtue of that compelling science, in 1990, the Clean Air Act was very significantly updated and signed into law. Those updates were signed into law by another Republican president, George Bush the first. And now we're finding in more recent years that the scientists are telling the Environmental Protection Agency that we need standards for mercury, ozone, soot, carbon, because these items are damaging human health. That 
set of four pollutants. Remember, you saw that on the slide under what's coming from coal. That we need to regulate these in order to protect human health and welfare. That Clean Air Act, when it was, um, when it was marshaled through and improved in 1990, the leader in the Minnesota delegation was Senator Dave Durenberger. And at the time, as now, Minnesota has 10 members of our congressional delegation. At that time, five of them were Republican and five Democrats. Dave Durenberger took on the task of trying to get 100% of them to vote yes for the Clean Air Act. And he succeeded. So 100% of the Minnesota delegation voted in favor. 89% of the US Senate voted in favor. Remember a time. Remember a time when we could have bipartisan progress based on human health and environmental improvement. And Minnesota was a leader in that. And when this law was under attack, still under attack, but when it was in, in, under attack in 2011, Dave Durenberger wrote into the Star Tribune, and here's what he said. He pointed out the track record of illnesses prevented and deaths prevented from the Clean Air Act, and couldn't see why there would be any reason why you would want to weaken that. That, of course, we want human health to improve over time. I'm going to skip that one, I think. But our work is not done. Remember, I referred to the American Lung Association, who we work with. Um, and nationally, they are, they are leaders in getting us to think about these relationships between pollution we're putting in the air and our own health. And they are, in particular, looking now at climate change and the heat waves that are coming with climate change and the greater humidity with climate change will make certain pollutants worse, especially for the very old and the very young, people with heart problems and respiratory problems going forward. They point to examples of pollen allergens, which get worse with higher CO2 levels. So I know it's hard to imagine tonight, but in a few weeks, we're going to be in, in allergy season. And those allergy seasons tend to be getting worse with higher CO2 and higher temperatures. And the data, I don't, do not know the data for, um, for Edina, but I know for my hometown of St. Paul, the number one cause of school absenteeism is asthma. And um, obviously, this is a problem for education and for families and for those kids who suffer from that. With greater extreme heat, we're going to see more asthma attacks. So there are all kinds of health-based reasons to take action on climate change. And I haven't even mentioned heart attacks and other things. So think about these things that are invisible in the air, carbon dioxide, as ultimately things that can kill people. And then you get a sense of the seriousness and urgency of this issue, for our own sakes. And here's some more good news. Although right now there's no nationwide limit on carbon from power plants, there's no limit. And I, I stress that because there was a poll that was just done that asked people what they thought about this business of you know, government regulating carbon emissions from power plants. And people said, well, people of all political Stripe said, that's a good idea. Majorities of people did. And then people said, then the, the people were asked, um, well, what do you, um, do you support? Again, do you support this? And they said, 57% of them said, yeah, we support it because it already exists. So 57% of Americans think there are limits on carbon from power plants when there are none. So they think it's a good idea, they accept it, but Congress hasn't taken care of it. Fortunately, Congress doesn't need to take care of it. The Environmental Protection Agency can take care of it. And that is because through the Clean Air Act, if um, there was a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court in April 2007, and the very conservative Supreme Court of this country said, global warming pollution harms, is a pollutant. And if the Environmental Protection Agency can document that it damages human health and welfare, then the EPA must set limits on that pollution. And that is exactly the trajectory we're on. And that is what President Obama was referring to a little bit obliquely in his State of the Union and his, in his inauguration address. He said, I would prefer bipartisan action by Congress, but if not, I will direct my administration to take action. So that is what we need to have happen in 2013. What about right here in Minnesota? I'm happy to say that um, a number of the organizations in the room here, as well as Fresh Energy, are part of a groundbreaking 
diverse campaign called Minnesota Clean Energy and Jobs. We just formed it, we announced it two months ago, and now there are 62 partner organizations in the campaign. The most recent ones to join were the League of Women Voters of Minnesota, and they include energy companies, faith groups, youth groups, environmental groups, conservation groups, and 10 labor unions. And we are working together on a campaign to improve Minnesota's clean energy policies. And what drove us to form together to take action, it's, it's a partnership of a size I've never seen in 17 years of doing this work in Minnesota. Because we're taking Governor Dayton's challenge, which he gave to this legislature, he said, in 2007, we had a bipartisan consensus and we started Minnesota down the path to clean energy. And now we need to take the next big steps forward on solar energy and wind energy. And we need to do it for the benefit of future generations, for our kids. And he was right. And so we think that we need to move that, the dial on that 25% by 2025 renewable electricity standard. And we need to look out to 2030 and increase it and strengthen it to 40%. There is no technical barrier why we couldn't get 40% renewable electricity on our electric grid. So we need to move in that direction. We need to do that this year. We need to finally get in the game on solar energy. We need a separate 10% by 2030 solar electricity standard that applies to all the utilities. 16 other states already have this. What's at stake for Minnesota is this. The legislature had testimony two weeks ago from Bloomberg New Energy Finance out of New York, who were invited into the legislature to say what has happened with the price of photovoltaics, of solar electric panels. And Bloomberg New Energy Finance began their two-hour discussion by saying this. They're saying, we're a company, and we have clients who hire us because they are interested in making investments that will have hefty returns, and they want to know whether solar is such a good investment. And then he mentioned they also have clients with kind of different interests, like the State Department and the Pentagon, who are interested in, in protecting the military forces and interested in new development around, all around the country that's going to be more sustainable. So they're interested in solar electricity too. And then he went on to testify that the price of solar electricity globally has come down since 2008 by 80%. So, solar is coming. It will soon be at parity within the next, certainly within the next 15 to 20 years with other sources of energy, but we can't wait for that to happen because in 15 years, when everyone is putting up solar, will those solar panels be built in New Jersey and China? And will Minnesota have the installation capacity to, so that we can hire fellow Minnesotans to get those installations done. We need to create the solar manufacturing and installation marketplace in Minnesota, and we need to send the signal to companies, Minnesota is a place to do business because we've got a standard that is going to drive generation. We need to get that done this year. And we will start to see the deployment that will be the local sources of energy that Minnesotans tell us in poll after poll they want to see more of. We know that people love solar. The Minnesota Environmental Partnership did a survey in January of this year of where you want your future electricity to come from to supply your, your utility, and 87% of Minnesotans said they want solar energy, and 84% said they want wind energy. And those numbers are high across the political spectrum, and they are high across the state, in every region of the state. And so we need to get this done, and the legislature needs to get this done. And we also need to have a workable plan, as I mentioned, to meet these carbon pollution reduction role, goals. The way those two things are connected is this. Every time we deploy renewable energy, we cut carbon and we use coal plants less and we are starting to close down coal plants in Minnesota. So we are making progress here going forward. I'm gonna take, I think, a few questions at the end, but I wanna just tell you a couple of the things that drive me going forward and to give you a sense of how you can help. Um, we are having, as part of this clean energy and jobs campaign, 
a rally and day at the Capitol on Monday, on Earth Day. And Governor Dayton will be a speaker at that event. And Will Steger will be a speaker at the, that event. And there will be a young person who is a leader in this campaign. And there will be a faith leader who's a member of this campaign and businesses. And we're hoping to get 1,000 people to the Capitol because on that very day, the omnibus energy bill that includes most of the things I've been talking about tonight will be moving through committees. We hope it'll be moving through committees. But I got to tell you, there has been a lot of testimony, especially from the utility companies, against everything I've said. And so we need to hear from regular Minnesotans going forward. I hope you will join us. Secondly, if you like the, this kind of approach, this analytical approach, but a very aggressive approach to moving Minnesota forward so that we can be a leader nationally, I hope you will support Fresh Energy. And we have a unique opportunity now through Earth Day, now through Monday, and if you stop by our table outside, I can tell you about this. Um, we have a 100% match opportunity. If you donate money to Fresh Energy, the Energy Foundation will match it 100% through Earth Day. So that would be a big leg up for us and allow us to really boost what we're doing in Minnesota. We hope you'll take advantage of that match going forward. And I hope you'll be in touch with me going forward because I'd love to work with all of you. Here's what keeps me going. I look around at audiences like this who've come out through incredible circumstances. I tell my colleagues who live in other places, yeah, we're having an extreme weather event tonight and there'll be seven inches of snow and still there'll be 100 people and they just cannot believe it. Um, so it's wonderful that you're here, but you are also part of the generation that is the healthiest, wealthiest, best educated, most connected generation in human history. So when you're faced with a big problem and a challenge, like making economic opportunities out of climate change, of course we can do it, but we have to get started. Thank you very much. Thanks. There's, uh, the state is, has a new billion dollar um, infrastructure program to improve the electrical grid. Uh, you, and what do you think the effect of this is going to be on increasing wind energy? I mean, there's more opportunities for smaller, uh, you know, individual farmers and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the sound is Booming? getting garbled. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. sorry. Uh, the state has a, uh, a billion dollar infrastructure improvement program that's begun for the electrical grid. And I'm wondering if um, you've heard of it and what it's going to be, what uh, effect it's going to have on generating more wind energy. And, and the part I missed was the $1 billion the state has for what? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I don't Maybe, to. yeah, just help that. <laughs> well, it has, you know, if, um, uh, it supposedly improves the electrical grid throughout the state, so I'm, I'm asking uh, what do you see the effect being on individual farmers and other people? Who can, you know, pump and I'm not familiar with this $1 billion program, um, but I tell you what's happening is there, there's a lot of investment going on. I think the big news is people, for years it was true that the, the electric system in this state, in this country, were really static. That the power plants had been built, we were finding 100% or nearly so reliable, affordable electricity. We were getting our needs met, and there wasn't much change happening. We were still building central station power plants. We were still building 19th century technology. But the paradigm has shifted. And now, modern utility companies are doing things very differently. They know that they need more flexibility. They know that they need to be able to tap into the smart grid eventually. They know they need to deal with these coming climate standards. And they know that they need to deal with this really robust initiative in not only Minnesota but other places to do, to make it possible for more Minnesotans and more Americans to not only uh, be consumers of power but to generate their own local power and to integrate that into the grid. So things are changing. So we here at the legislature, it's too soon to talk about these things the Minnesota Clean Energy and Jobs campaign is talking about. How could it possibly be too soon when we're dealing with climate change and the need for next generation jobs? is part of our answer. But the other is, the utility companies themselves are starting to make economic decisions to retire old coal plants, and that power needs to be replaced 
with cleaner, more efficient sources of energy. So there are going to be lots of investments, and we as the public need to make sure more of those investments are, all of those investments, are much smarter and much cleaner investments. So there's a big opportunity, and maybe we need to move on. I see a, I see a, a guest back there who I've not seen before, Tolby. <laughs> Hi, Tolby. <laughs> Do we have time for more questions, Paul, one or one, we, one more? Okay. Yes. As regards uh, so. <laughs> as regards solar power. Holding that a little bit further away, I think that might work like <laughs> Is that. Right? Okay. Yeah. It'll reverberate less if I help. All right. Is, is this better? Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As regards solar power, currently the nation of China controls 80 percent of the world market for manufacturing. They're doing that through slave labor, there are no pollution controls on the chemicals that have to be used to make solar panels, and uh, government support of prices, which means that among other things, they're violating the World Trade Organization, they're stealing our patents, and they've been doing it for decades, and the American federal government seems unwilling or unable to act. Uh, they have bankrupted many solar manufacturers in the United States, including Solera, which has gotten a lot of negative publicity because of the mm -hmm. Department of Energy's investments in it. They've also bankrupted most of the solar energy uh, industry in Spain. Do you really believe that they're going to be manufacturing jobs in Minnesota as a result of embracing solar unless or until our federal government does something? Yes, absolutely. So part of, the, part of what individual states, and I mentioned the 16 other states that are taking action, many of those states are actually cloudier states than Minnesota. So they have less good solar resource. I think of, I'm from New York, but my neighboring state, New Jersey, very cloudy state, has 70 times the solar installation that Minnesota does. And it does not have 70 times the population of Minnesota. So policy drivers generated by that Republican administration and the cloudy parts of Oregon also have much more solar development than Minnesota. So I know that policy can make a difference. There are already two solar manufacturing plants in Minnesota. There are 100 companies in Minnesota that are already part of the solar supply chain. So they range from companies like Fastenal to 3M that all are developing parts of what goes into the solar value chain. So it's already happening in Minnesota, but we need to take the next big step up, and it's really critical what happens in the next few years going forward. And really, we need policymakers to take sharp pencils and to take a look at what we want Minnesota to be and not wait till 2024, but to start doing it right now and to start taking advice. There, you would not believe the crowded hearing rooms and the depth and expertise of the solar industry professionals who are in Minnesota testifying right now in the legislature about what is possible in Minnesota. And the possibility in Minnesota has been run through the JEDI model at, at the Department of Energy. It's called JEDI, G, uh, capital J-E-D-I, great name, huh? Which shows that a 10% solar electricity standard for Minnesota in the first year would mean 2,000 jobs. And so, and those are permanent family supporting jobs. And so that is why the labor unions are with us because they are interested in all kinds of manufacturing and installation, skilled labor from many different labor shops that, or non-labor shops that could be applied in Minnesota to building these technologies and getting them deployed. Yeah. Well, let's give Jay a big round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, Paul, you've got a uh, drawing here. I'll let you uh, take over. Thank you. Well, who is this? Getting some help. It's Tolby. Every Edina kid knows who Tolby is. Hi, Tolby. Watch your step. Those are lovely shoes you have this evening. So who can tell me what Tolby means? Anyone? Turn off lights behind you. It was devised by a 10-year-old, and now kids all over Minnesota, through the work of the Center for Energy and Environment, are finding out it's a smart thing to do. And the parents love it because it saves lots of money in their pocket. 
Mindy and I are working now in all the Edina schools to what do we do after Tolby? How do we really build the climate leaders that are going to move us into this new uh, generation? And we feel the best way we can do it is make it easy for you. So Tolby, I know your fingers don't work so well, but will you fly around a little bit so people can see your tail? Look at that CFL. Tolby, it's the Tolby Shuffle. So we've got a bunch of cards here from people who want to have a home energy squad visit. How many of you filled out cards? All right, we're gonna see. This is a $300 value, and you're getting it for free. The rest of you can sign up. Uh, the Edina Energy Commission is buying down 30 more uh, home energy squad visits for $50. So you can get a $300 value for $50 if you sign up with Judy at the C uh, CEE table right outside. And I'm gonna have someone here with smaller fingers come up. Alana, would you help me please? This is high tech. There we go. Now don't look. Reach in there. Our first winner Aileen Foley. Aileen, congratulations. Aileen was one of the volunteers tonight with Meg Davidson. Number two. You want to read it? Sure. Tom Bogan? Tom, Tom Boyan? Are you here? B O. Bogan, B-O-G-E-N, not here. Too bad for him. <laughs> Paul Lang, a winner. This is truly a prize that keeps on giving because you're gonna be saving month after month after month. And our last winner, Mark Rosenberg. Where's Mark? All right, congratulations. <laughs> Alana, will you take these out to, um, to Judy so she knows? Uh, and when, you're, when we're done here, we want everyone to go and sign up because that $50 thing is only for tonight. So if you want to get a, a rebate and get a Home Energy Squad visit for $50, you have to sign up this evening. Great. Okay, thanks, Toby. We'll be thinking of you. So to end our evening, well, we're not done yet. Can somebody help me with this? Uh, we're going to go over a couple actions that uh, Edinans, we've done these especially for you. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so this is the take action part. Uh, most of you are here because you care deeply about what's happening with our climate and environment. Uh, we know that would, there would have been a lot more people here tonight had the weather been better, but we're asking each of you to go out and share the message and the impact that this evening has had on you. So we have five working groups, four of them are active. Uh, Education and Outreach puts on events like this, is chaired by myself and Bob Gubrud. Bob, would you stand up please? Bob has been instrumental in getting the Home Energy Squad visits. Thank you so much. Our energy group is chaired by Bill Sirks. Bill, would you stand up? He's the chair of our commission. And John here, who's not here tonight. But uh, they work with alternative energy and ways that we can work to save energy and develop new energy systems in Edina. Our solid waste and recycling leaders are Diane Plunkett-Latham and Sarah Zarin, working with uh, all kinds of things that the mayor had talked about, but especially moving now into the business uh, community to improve business recycling, working with the farmer's market, uh, Great job by both of them. And water quality, is Julie Risser here? Julie's not here. 
and you can see that air quality needs your help. We do not have uh, a working air quality group. If you're interested, please visit the table outside. Uh, we want to thank the Center for Energy and Environment for providing us with the free Home Energy Squad visits. Uh, you can sign up at their table. We want to thank XL Energy for being here. How many people use WindSource? WindSource is something you can go to the website, you can click on a button, and every month your energy bill will come from a wind farm. So you can use wind, wind service, uh, wind energy, just by paying, uh, saying you want to do it. Uh, Saver Switch helps to save energy in the summer with uh, cutting off your air conditioner for short periods of time during heavy energy use. And the Solar Rewards Program shows you that solar is within reach. It's time to cut our carbon. Tomorrow night, uh, Edina has its first community garden. In six days, they sold all 55 spots. Mindy and, and I were signed up. We wanted to sign up, and we tried to, and it was too late. So we hope that this is the beginning of many community gardens. But tomorrow evening is the second of three workshops. They're free on gardening uh, at the YMCA on York. The next one after that is May 17th. Uh, Jay had talked about the Earth Day at the Capitol. We have a flyer that you'll receive on your way out to help build legislative support. Next Thursday night, a week from tonight, the Edina Interfaith Environmental Coalition is having a free Greening Your Congregation workshop. If you have questions, see Sean Geshevsky or Joanne Knudsen out at the table. And then on the 5th of May, also at Colonial Church, Cool Planet is hosting its 15th uh, Concerned About the Climate Speak Up workshop with Dr. John Abraham on the science of climate and Dr. Christy Manning to talk about how to have effective conversations with your family, your friends, and move the conversation of climate solutions into your community. So we appreciate you being here tonight. The snow continues to fall. If you need to sleep here, maybe we can make arrangements. But we thank you all for coming, and thank you for all the people that have made this possible. Next year, we promise better weather.